Hey there. Um, I wanted to kind of continue my Zizek train here um, and read a little bit from a book that he wrote with John Milbank, which is called The Monstrosity of Christ, Paradox or Dialectic. Um, I looked all around our house and I could not find um, our paper copy, so I'll be reading from um, my Kindle version, but I will um, share what the cover of the book looks like and a link to it as well so you can find it yourself. Um, so anyways, I was looking through this for a school project and um, I just thought it would be interesting um, for the process of you know, truly absorbing it myself, but also sharing it with others, um, to read uh, a chapter in here from Zizek that's called The Fear of Four Words, A Modest Plea for the Hegelian Reading of Christianity. Um, and so as I've been going through different uh, Hegelian um, essays and things like that, and also Zizek essays as well, I thought this would uh, sort of fit the ticket, right? Um, so yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Um, this is a long, long chapter, so I probably will split it up over a couple videos. Um, so, you know, we'll just get through what we can today. All right. All right, I'm going to go ahead and start reading now. G.K. Chesterton concluded the Oracle of the Dog with Father Brown's defense of common sense reality. Things are just what they are, not bearers of hidden mystical meanings. And the Christian miracle of incarnation is the exception that guarantees and sustains this common reality. People readily swallow the untested claims of this, that, or the other. It's drowning all your old rationalism and skepticism. It's coming in like a sea, and the name of it is superstition. It's the first effect of not believing in God that you lose your common sense and can't see things as they are. Anything that anybody talks about and says there's a good deal in it extends itself indefinitely like a vista in a nightmare. And a dog is an omen, and a cat is a mystery, and a pig is a mascot, and a beetle is a scarab, calling up all the menagerie of polytheism from Egypt and old India, dog Anubis and great green-eyed Pasht, and all the holy howling bulls of Bashan, reeling back to the bestial gods of the beginning, escaping into elephants and snakes and crocodiles, and all because you are frightened of four words, he was made man. It was thus his very Christianity that made Chesterton prefer prosaic explanations to all too fast resorts to supernatural magic and to engage in writing de detective fiction. If a jewel is stolen from a locked container, the solution is not telekinesis, but the use of a strong magnet or some other sleight of hand. If a person vanishes unexpectedly, there must be a secret tunnel and so on. This is why naturalistic explanations are more magic than a resort to supernatural intervention. How much more magic is the detective's explanation of a tri tricky deceit by means of which the criminal accomplished the murder in a locked room than the claim that he possessed the supernatural ability to move through walls? I am even tempted to go a step further here and give Chesterton's last line a different reading, a no doubt not intended by Chesterton, but nonetheless closer to a weird truth. When people imagine all kinds of deeper meanings because they are frightened of four words, he was made man. What really frightens them is that they will lose the transcendent God guaranteeing the meaning of the universe, God as the hidden master pulling the strings. Instead of this, we get a God who abandons this transcendent position and throws himself into his own creation, fully engaging himself in it up to dying so that we humans are left with no higher power watching over us, just with the terrible burden of freedom and responsibility for the fate of divine creation and thus of God himself. Are we not still too frightened today to assume all these consequences of the four words? Do those who call themselves Christians not prefer to stay with the comfortable image of God, sitting up there benevolently watching over our lives, sending us his son as a token of his love, or even more comfortably, just with some depersonalized higher force? The axiom of this essay is that there is only one philosophy which thought the implications of the four words through to the end, Hegel's idealism, which is why almost all philosophers are also no less frightened of Hegel's idealism. The, anti, the ultimate anti-Hegelian argument is the very fact of this post-Hegelian break. What even the most fanatical partisan of Hegel cannot deny is that something changed after Hegel, that a new era of thought began, which could no longer be accounted for in Hegelian terms of absolute conceptual mediation. 
This rupture occurs in different guises from Schilling's assertion of the abyss of pre-logical will, vulgarized later by Schopenhauer, and Kierkegaard's insistence on the uniqueness of faith and subjectivity through Marx's assertion of the actual socioeconomic life process and the full automization of mathematized natural sciences, up to Freud's theme of death drive as a repetition that insists beyond all dialectical mediation. Something happened here. There's a clear break between before and after. And while one can argue that Hegel already announces this break, that he is the last of the idealist metaphysicians and the first of the post-metaphysical historicists, one cannot really be a Hegelian after this break. Hegelianism has lost its innocence forever. To act like a full Hegelian today is the same as to write tonal music after the Schoenberg revolution. The predominant Hegelian strategy that is emerging as a reaction to the scarecrow image of Hegel, the absolute idealist, is the deflated image of Hegel freed of ontological metaphysical commitments, reduced to a general theory of discourse, of possibilities of argumentation. This approach is best exemplified by the so-called Pittsburgh Hegelians, Brandom and McDowell. No wonder Habermas praises Brandom since Habermas also avoids directly approaching the big ontological question, are humans really a subspecies of animals? Is Darwinism true? The question of God or nature, of idealism or materialism. It would be easy to prove that Habermas's neo-Kantian avoiding of ontological commitment is in itself necessarily ambiguous. While Habermas and the Pittsburgh Hegelians treat naturalism as the obscene secret not to be publicly admitted. Of course man developed from nature. Of course Darwin was right. This obscure secret is a lie. It covers up the idealist form of thought, the a priori transcendentals of communication which cannot be deduced from natural being. The truth here is in the form. Just as in Marx's old example of royalists in the republican form, while Habermasians secretly think they are really materialists, the truth is in the idealist form of their thinking. Such a deflated image of Hegel is not enough. We should approach the post-Hegelian break in more direct terms. True, there is a break, but in this break, Hegel is the vanishing mediator between its before and its after, between traditional metaphysics and post-metaphysical 19th and 20th century thought. That is to say, something happens to Hegel, a breakthrough into a unique dimension of thought which is obliterated, rendered invisible in its true dimension by post-metaphysical thought. This obliteration leaves an empty space which has to be filled in so that the continuity of the development of philosophy can be reestablished. Filled in with what? The index of this obliteration is the ridiculous image of Hegel as the absurd absolute idealist who pretended to know everything, to possess absolute knowledge, to read the mind of God, to deduce the whole of reality out of the self-movement of his mind. The image which is an exemplary case of what Freud called um, screen memory, a fantasy formation intended to cover up a traumatic truth. In this sense, the post-Hegelian turn to concrete reality irreducible to notional mediation should rather be read as a desperate posthumous revenge of metaphysics, as an attempt to reinstall metaphysics, albeit in the inverted form of the primacy of concrete reality. The next standard argument against Hegel's philosophy of religion targets its teleological structure. It openly asserts the primacy of Christianity, Christianity as the true religion, the final point of the entire development of religions. It is easy to demonstrate how the notion of world religions, although it was invented in the era of Romanticism in the course of the opening toward another religions, um, in order to serve as the neutral conceptual container allowing us to democratically confer equal spiritual dignity on all great religions. Christianity, Islam, Bo uh, Hinduism, Buddha Buddhism, etc. Effectively privileges Christianity. Already a quick look makes it clear how Hinduism, and especially Buddhism, simply do not fit the notion of religion implied in the idea of world religions. However, what conclusion are we to draw from this? For Hegelian, there's nothing scandalous in this fact. Every particular religion, in effect, contains its own notion of what religion in general is so that there is no neutral universal notion of religion. Every such notion is already twisted in the direction of or colorized by, hegemonized by um, a particular religion. This, however, in no way entails a nominalist or historicist devaluation of universality. 
Rather, it forces us to pass from abstract to concrete universality, i.e. to articulate how the passage from one to another particular religion is not merely something that concerns the particular, but is simultaneously the inner development of the universal notion itself, its self-determination. Postcolonial critics like to dismiss Christianity as the whiteness of religions, the presupposed zero level of normality of the true religion with regard to which all other religions are distortions or variations. However, when today's New Age ideologists insist on the distinction between religion and spirituality, they perceive themselves as spiritual, not part of any organized religion. They often not so silently impose a pure procedure of Zen-like spiritual mediation excuse me, spiritual meditation as the whiteness of religion. The idea is that all religions presuppose, rely upon, exploit, manipulate, etc., the same core of mystical experience, and that it is only pure forms like meditation, um, pure forms of meditation like Zen, uh, Buddhism, that exemplify this core directly by passing institutional and dogmatic meditations, mediations. Oh my gosh. Spiritual meditation in its abstraction from institutionalized religion appears today as the zero level undistorted core of religion. The complex institutional and dogmatic edifice which sustains every particular religion is dismissed as a contingent secondary coding of this core. The reason for this shift of accent from religious institution to the intimacy of spiritual experience is that such a meditation is the ideological form that best fits today's global capitalism. So the trouble with Christ and orthodoxy. Do the three main versions of Christianity not form a kind of Hegelian triad? In the succession of orthodoxy, Catholicism, and Protestantism, each new term is a subdivision split off from a previous unity. This triad of universal, particular, singular can be designated by three representative founding figures, John, Peter, Paul, as well as by three races, Slavic, Latin, German. In Eastern Orthodoxy, we have the substantial unity of the text in the body of believers, which is why the believers are allowed to interpret the sacred text. The text goes on and lives in them. It is not inside, outside the living history as its exempted standard and model. The substance of religious life is the Christian community itself. Catholicism stands for radical alienation, the entity which mediates between the founding sacred text and the body of believers, the church, the religious institution regains its full autonomy. The highest authority resides in the church, which is why the church has the right to interpret the text. The text is read during the mass in Latin, a language which is not understood by ordinary believers. And it is even considered a sin for an ordinary believer to read the text directly, bypassing the priest's guidance. For Protestantism, finally, the only authority is the text itself. And the wager is on every believer's direct contact with the word of God as delivered in the text. The mediator, the particular, thus disappears, which draws into insignificance, enabling the believer to adopt the position of a universal singular, the individual in direct contact with the divine universality, bypassing the mediating role of the particular institution. This reconciliation, however, becomes possible only after alienation is brought to the extreme. In contrast to the Catholic notion of a caring and loving God, with whom one can communicate, negotiate even, Protestantism starts with the notion of God deprived of any common measure shared with man, of God as an impenetrable beyond who distributes grace in a totally contingent way. The key doctrinal division between Orthodoxy and Western Christianity, both Catholicism and Protestantism, concerns the procession of the Holy Spirit. For the Latin tradition, the Holy Spirit proceeds from both Father and Son, while for the Orthodox it proceeds from the Father alone. From this perspective of the monarchy of the Father as the unique source of the three uh, divine hypostases, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Latin notion of double procession introduces an all too rational logic of relations into God. Father and Son are conceived as relating to each other in the mode of opposition, and the Holy Spirit then appears as their reunion not genuinely a third new person. We thus do not have a genuine trinity, but a return of the dyad to one, a reabsorption of the dyad into one. So since the principle of the sole monarchy of the father is abandoned, the only way to think the oneness of the divine triad is to depersonalize it, 
so that in the end we get the impersonal one, the God of philosophers of their natural theology. Apropos of this disputed question of the origin of the Holy Spirit, Hegel committed a weird slip of the tongue. He mistakenly claimed that for orthodoxy, the Holy Spirit originates from both Father and Son, and for Western Christianity, from the Son alone, from Christ's resurrection in the community of believers. As he wrote, the disagreement between East and West concerns knowing. If the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, or from the Father and the Son, the Son being only the one who actualizes, who reveals, thus from him alone the Spirit proceeds. For Hegel, it is thus not even thinkable for the Holy Spirit to proceed from the Father alone. And my point is that there is a truth in the slip of the tongue. Hegel's underlying premise is that what dies on the cross is not only God's earthly representative incarnation, but the God of beyond itself. Christ is the vanishing mediator between the substantial transcendent God and itself in God qua virtual spiritual community. The shift from subject to predicate is avoided in orthodoxy, where Godfather continues to pull the strings, is not really caught in the process. Orthodoxy accounts for the trinity of divine persons by positing a real difference in God himself, the difference between essence or usia and its uh, personal hypostases. God is one with regard to essence and triple with regard to personality. However, the three persons are not just united in the substantial oneness of the divine essence. They are also united through the monarchy of the Father, who as a person is the origin of the other two hypostases. The Father as person does not fully overlap with his essence since he can share it with or impart it to the other two persons, so that the three are consubstantial. Each divine person includes in himself the whole of divine nature and substance. The substance is not divided in three parts. This distinction between essence and its hypostases is crucial for the orthodox notion of the human person because it takes place also in the created and fallen universe. Person is not the same as individual. As an individual, I am defined by my particular nature, by my natural properties, my physical and psychic qualities. I am here as part of substantial reality, and what I am, I am at the expense of others, demanding my share of reality. But this is not what makes me a unique person, the unfathomable abyss of myself. No matter how much I look into my own properties, even the most spiritual ones, I will never find a feature that makes me a person. Person signifies the irreducibility of man to his nature, the irreducibility and not something irreducible or something which makes man irreducible to his nature, precisely because it cannot be a question here of something distinct from another nature, but of someone who is distinct from his own nature. It is only this unfathomable void which accounts for my freedom, as well as for my unique singularity which distinguishes me from all others. What distinguishes me are not my personal idiosyncrasies, the quirks of my particular nature, but the abyss of my personality. This is why it is only within the Holy Spirit as a member of the body of the church that I can attain my singularity. This is how man is made in the image and likeness of God. What makes a human being like God is not a superior or even divine quality of the human mind. One should thus leave behind the well-known motifs of a human being as a deficient copy of divinity, of man's finite substance as a copy of the divine infinite substance, of analogies of being, etc. It is only at the level of person, qua person, qua this abyss beyond all properties, that man is in the image of God, which means that God himself must also be not only an essential substance, but also a person. Lasky links this distinction between uh, human nature and person to the duality of Son and Holy Spirit, of redemption and deification. The, redemp the redeeming work of the Son is related to our nature. The deifying work of the Holy Spirit concerns our persons. The divine dispensation of humankind has two aspects, negative and positive. Christ's sacrifice is only the precondition for our deification. It changes our nature so that it becomes open to grace and can strive for deification. In Christ, God made himself man that man might become God, so that the redeeming work of Christ is seen to be directly related to the ultimate goal of creatures, to know union with God. As such, Christ's sacrifice provides only a precondition for the ultimate goal, which is the deification of humanity. The idea of our ultimate deification cannot be expressed as a Christological basis alone, but demands a pneumatological development as well. 
Orthodoxy thus deprives Christ of his central role, since the final prospect is that of the deification becoming God of man. Man can become by grace what God is by nature. This is why the adoration of Christ's humanity is almost alien to Orthodox piety. From the strict Christian standpoint, the Orthodox symmetrical reversal, God became man so that man can become God, misses the point of incarnation. Once God became man, there was no longer a God one could return to or become. So one would have to paraphrase Arrhenius's motto, God made himself man, that man might become God who made himself man. The point of incarnation is that one cannot become God, not because God dwells in a transcendent beyond, but because God is dead. So the whole idea of approaching a transcendent God becomes irrelevant. The only identification is the identification with Christ. From the Orthodox standpoint, however, the exclusively juridical theology of Western Christianity thus misses the true sense of Christ's sacrifice itself, reducing it to the juridical dimension of paying for our sins. Entering the actuality of the fallen world, he broke the power of sin in our nature and by his death, which reveals the supreme degree of his entrance, into our fallen state he triumphed over death and corruption the message of christ's sacrifice is victory over death the first fruits of the general resurrection the liberation of human nature from captivity under the devil and not only the justification but also the restoration of creation in christ christ breaks the hold of um, fallen nature over us thereby creating the conditions for our deification his gesture is negative, breaking with nature, overcoming death, while the positive side is provided by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the formula, Christ is our king, is to be taken in the Hegelian sense of the monarch as the exception. What we humans are from grace, he is by nature, a being of the perfect accord between being and ought. The primordial fact is that the primordial fact is the oneness of essence, substance, and the trinity of persons in God. This trinity is not deduced and relational, but an original and unfathomable mystery, in clear contrast to the God of the philosophers, who see him in the primordial simplicity of the cause. Uh, antinomies in our perception of God must be maintained, so that God remains an object of odd contemplation of his mysteries, not the object of rationalist analyses. The opposition between positive and negative theology is thus grounded in God himself, in the real distinction in God between essence and divine operations of energies or the divine economy. If the energies descend to us, the essence remains absolutely inaccessible. The main mode of this descent of the divine energy is grace. Precisely because God is unknowable in that which he is, orthodox theology distinguishes between the essence of God and his energies, between the inaccessible nature of the Holy Trinity and its natural processions. The Bible, in its concrete language, speaks of nothing other than energies when it tells us of the glory of God, a glory with innumerable names which surrounds the inaccessible being of God, making him known outside himself while concealing what he is in himself. And when we speak of the divine energies in relation to the human beings to whom they are communicated and given, and by whom they are appropriated, this divine and uncreated reality within us is called grace. This distinction between the unknowable essence of the Trinity and its energetic manifestations outside the essence fits the Hegelian opposition between in itself and for us. Independently of the existence of creatures, the Trinity is manifested in the rad radiance of its glory. From all eternity, the Father is the Father of glory, the Word is the brightness of his glory, and the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of glory. However, from the strict Hegelian standpoint, this move is deeply problematic. It is not the es very essence of the Son to enable God to manifest himself and intervene in human history. And even more, is not the Holy Spirit the personality of the community itself, its spiritual substance? Lasky is aware of this problem. If the name Holy Spirit expresses a more divine economy than a personal quality, it, this is because the third hypostasis is par excellence, the hypostasis of manifestation, the person in whom we know God, the Trinity. His person is hidden from us by the very profusion of the divinity which he manifests. What remains unthinkable within this perspective is the full engagement of God in human history, which culminates in the figure of the suffering God. 
From a proper Christian perspective, this is the true meaning of the divine trinity, that God's manifestation is in human history is part of his very essence. In this way, God is no longer a monarch who eternally dwells in his absolute transcendence. The very difference between eternal essence and its manifestation or the divine economy should be abandoned. What we get in orthodoxy instead of this full divine engagement, instead of the God who goes to the end and sacrifices himself for the redemption of humans, instead of the notion of the history of human redemption as a history in which the fate of God himself is decided, is a God who dwells in his trinity beyond all human history and comprehension, where the incarnation in Christ as a fully human mortal and the establishment of the Holy Spirit as the community of believers are just an echo, a kind of platonic copy of the eternal trinity in itself, totally unrelated to human history. The key question here is, how does the distinction between essence and its manifestation or energy economy relate to the distinction between essence, qua substantial nature, and person, between usia and hypostasis and Hegelis, to the distinction between substance and subject? What orthodoxy is unable to do is to identify these two distinctions. God is a person precisely and only in his mode of manifestation. The lessons of Christian incarnation, God becomes man, is that to speak of divine persons outside incarnation is meaningless, at best a reminder of pagan polytheism. Of course, the Bible says God sent and sacrificed his only son. But the way to read this is, the Son was not present in God prior to Incarnation, sitting up there at his side. Incarnation is the birth of Christ, and after his death there is neither Father nor Son, but only the Holy Spirit, the spiritual substance of the religious community. Only in this sense is the Holy Spirit the synthesis of Father and Son, of substance and subject. Christ stands for the gap of negativity, for subjective singularity, and in the Holy Spirit the substance is reborn as a virtual community of singular subjects persisting only in and through their activity. Orthodoxy thus falls short of the central fact of Christianity, the shift in the entire balance of the universe implied by the incarnation. The notion of the deification of man presupposes the father as a substantial central point of reference to which or whom man should return. Hegel's idea that what dies on the cross is the God of beyond itself is unthinkable here. And the supreme irony is that Lossky wrote a detailed analysis of Meister Eckhart, although his orthodoxy is completely opposed to Eckhart's central tenet, the eccentricity of God himself on account of which God himself needs man in order to come to himself, to reach himself, to actualize himself, so that God is born in man, and man is the cause of God. What unites them is nonetheless the refusal or inability to endorse Christ's full humanity. They both reduce Christ to an ethereal being foreign to earthly reality. Furthermore, what both Lossky and Eckhart share is the accent on via negativa, approaching God through negating all predicates accessible to us, and thus asserting his absolute transcendence. So in Maester Eckhart, what makes Maester Eckhart so unbearable for all traditional theology is that, in his work, the most fundamental dualism is shattered, that between God and his creature, the self, the I. This is to be taken literally, beyond the standard platitudes about God becoming man, etc. It is not just that God gives birth to or creates man. It is also not merely that only through and in man, God becomes fully God, much more radically. It is man himself who gives birth to God. God is nothing outside man, although this nothing is not a mere nothing, but the abyss of the Godhead prior to God. And in this abyss, the very difference between God and man is annihilated and obliterated. We should be very precise here. With regard to this opposition between God and Godhead, it is an opposition between, is an opposition not between two kinds or species, but between God as something and Godhead as nothing. One usually speaks of God in opposition to the world or to man. God is opposed to non-God. In the Godhead, all opposition is effaced. In Kantian terms, the relationship between God and Godhead involves the indefinite and not a negative judgment. It isn't that Godhead isn't God. It's that Godhead is a non-God, an un-God, in the same sense as we talk of the undead, who are neither living or dead, but the living dead. This does not mean that the asymmetry between God and man is abolished, that they are posited at the same level with regard to the impersonal abyss of Godhead. 
However, their asymmetry turns around the standard one. It is God who needs man in order to reach himself to be born as God. God has such a need to seek us out, exactly as if all his Godhead depended on it, as in fact it does. God can no more dispense with us than we can dispense with him. Even if it were possible that we might turn away from God, God could never turn away from us. What this means is that just as for Heidegger, human being is Dasein, the there of being itself, the only side of its clearing, for Eckhart, I am the only there side of God. In my eternal birth, all things were born, and I was cause of myself as well as of all things. If I had willed it, neither I nor any things would be. And if I myself were not, God would not be either. That God is God. Of this I am a cause. If I were not, God would not be God. There is, however, no need to understand this. So note the final qualification there. Or as Reiner Sherman uh, concisely recapitulates to Eckhart's point, I do not reflect God. I do not reproduce him. I declare him. Declare, of course, retains here all its performative strength. What this paradox implies is Eckhart's fundamental insight. While one's human being has a center outside of it, in God, God's being too has a corresponding eccentricity. What this means is that the eccentric character of a man, the fact that he has his center outside himself in God, should not be understood as the relationship between perfect, uncreated, and imperfect created substance between the sun and its planets that circulate around it. This eccentricity decenters God himself. And it is with regard to this otherness or Godhead in God himself that man and God are related. God himself can relate to himself only through man, which is why the difference between God and not God is a cleft that splits man thoroughly. The two clefts thus overlap. Man is eccentric with regard to God, but God himself is eccentric with regard to his own ground, the abyss of Godhead. And it is only through man's detachment from all creatures that God himself reaches himself. Not only does grace make the son be born within us in his divinity, but the human being engenders the son in God. It is again crucial to note the asymmetry here. Insofar as we consider God and man as two substances, the perfect, infinite, uncreated one and the imperfect, finite, created one, there can be no relation of identity between the two, only an external relation of analogy of cause and effect. It is only with regard to Godhead, to ungod or unding in God, that man can be identical to God. There is, however, crucial and perhaps structurally necessary ambiguity in Eckhart with regard to the birth of God and man. To put it in brutally simplified terms, who or what is given birth to here, God or Godhead? Does God, through man's releasement, reach back to the void of Godhead, of the abyss of his own nature, or is God word born out of the abyss of Godhead? Compare these two passages from the same uh, page of Sherman's book. The glory of God is that man breaks through beyond the creator. Then the son is born in the paternal heart and man finds his God, the Godhead. Also, God is nothing as long as man lacks the breakthrough to the Godhead. If you do not consent to detachment, God will miss his Godhead and man will miss himself. What is it then? In order to clarify this point on which everything hangs, we should inquire more closely into what Eckhart actually means by God and Godhead. Their relationship is not that of substance and subject. It is not the Godhead, it is not that the Godhead is the chaotic impersonal substance nature and God a person. God is the only thing. It is everything that is. This is what explains Eckhart's strange reading of the sense in which God suffered to us. Only that is poverty of spirit when one keeps oneself so clear of God and of all one's works that if God wants to act in the mind, he is himself the place wherein he wants to act. And this he likes to do. For if God finds man so poor, he operates his own work and man suffers God in him. And God in, is himself the site of this operation, since God is an agent who acts within himself. He who suffers without being attached to his suffering has God bear his burden, making it light and gentle for him. To detach oneself from one's pain means to consider it 
not as one's own, but as assumed by God himself, a human being who is a wife, gives back to God the suffering that has befallen him. The radicality of this reinterpretation of God's suffering for us is unheard of. God, not Godhead, should be grasped as the Spinozan Deus Sive Natura, a substance in which all activity and passivity, all creating and being created, all joy and suffering, all love and anguish and fear take place. As such, contrary to the deceptive appearance generated by the word God, God is not a person, even if one can attribute feelings and desires to him. There is no freedom in it, no choice, just a necessity. God qua creator does what he has to do. So it is God, not Godhead, who or which is the impersonal substance. And God reaches the Godhead, actualizes it only in and through man. But here's been, um, but here is Eckhart's real breakthrough, the move that in effect points beyond Spinoza and German idealism. This is not all it is. What lies outside the substance is nothing itself. Godhead as the abyss of undying. There is in Eckhart no word about the divine suffering as the price paid by God in our sins, about all this judicial penal aspects of the way of the cross. It is simply that since God, not as Thomas Aquinas and others thought the supreme substance, but the only substance, everything, all creatures and their relations take place in him. So when through releasement, we detach ourselves from creatureliness, from the reality of decay and identify with the abyss of Godhead, we no longer suffer. All the suffering remains where it always was, in the divine substance. Only we are no longer there. From this notion of God as a substance caught in its own necessity, Eckhart draws the inevitable radical conclusion. There is nothing for which we should be grateful to God. I will never thank God that he loves me, for he cannot do otherwise, whether he wishes it or not. His nature forces him to it. Since God is merely a thing, not only do I not have to ask or solicit him for anything, insofar as I return to the original poverty of the abyss that I am, I can even command him. The humble man does not solicit anything from God, but he can indeed command him. When Eckhart writes that anyone who wants to receive Jesus must become as free of all representations as he was when he was not yet, before his birth on earth, he is of course referring to Plato, to the Platonic notion of the soul prior to its bodily dwelling. However, in contrast to Plato, this pre-existence does not involve a soul which, uncontaminated by the images of sensory things, holds eternal ideas but one which purifies itself of all things, ideas included, and including God himself as a thing. More of a kind of tabula rasa, an empty receptacle. Only in such a state of pure receptivity, which is nothing in itself, and thus potentially a place for everything, am I truly free, a virgin of all images. This is how Eckhart interprets the virginity of Mary. Only a virgin, a soul purified of all creaturely things, is open to receive and conceive, and then give birth to Jesus' word. To introduce a later distinction here, freedom for Eckhart is freedom from, as well as freedom for. Freedom from all creaturely images, and as such, freedom for conceiving and giving birth to God. He was big with nothingness as a woman is with a child. In this nothingness, God was born. He was the fruit of nothingness. God was born in nothingness. So there is a freedom which is not just Spinozan conceived necessity. When I rejoin the abyss of the Godhead, I become free. Here, however, we reach the crux of the matter. What is the relationship between the two nothings, the abyss of Godhead, the origin source of everything, and the abyss of the poverty of man? So when Sherman writes that in this detachment, the nuda ascentia anime joins the nuda ascentia d, how are we to understand this? Are the two voids simply to be identified? The asymmetry is clear here. If they are to be identified, then one of them, the abyss of Godhead, the nothingness of the ungod, has priority. And what happens in detachment is that in achieving the supreme poverty, man rejoins the um, divine abyss. How then are we to think the difference between the two abysses? Only by distinguishing 
between the nothingness of the primordial abyss or godhead and the nothingness of the primordial gesture of um, contraction what Schilling called oh my gosh I'm not reading that it's German <laughs> the gesture of supreme egotism of withdrawing from reality and reducing oneself to the punctuality of self in the mystical tradition it was um, Jakob Burma who took this uh, crucial step forward this withdrawal into self is the primordial form of evil so one can also say that Eckhart is not yet able to think the evil aspects of divinity. And there is a necessity in the shift from nothingness as the abyss of Godhead to nothingness as the void of myself. The necessity of the passage from potentiality to actuality. The divine void is pure potentiality, which can actualize itself only in the guise of the punctuality of evil. And giving birth to the sun word is the only way to move beyond this evil. Linked to this is a further inability of Eckhart, the inability to think the encounter with a thing which would not be simply an encounter with a created object or substance. In the specific sense, Eckhart in effect misses the central feature of the Judeo-Christian tradition in which man's encounter with divinity is not the result of withdrawal into the depths of my inner self and the ensuing realization of the identity of the core of myself in the core of divinity, um, Atman Brahman in Hinduism, etc. That is the overwhelming argument for the intimate link between Judaism and psychoanalysis. In both cases, the focus is on the traumatic encounter with the abyss of the desiring other. The Jewish people's encounter with their God, whose impenetrable call derails the routine of daily existence. The child's encounter with the enigma of the other's jouissance. This feature seems to distinguish the Jewish psychoanalytic paradigm not only from any version of paganism and Gnosticism with their emphasis on inner spiritual self-purification, on virtue as the realization of one's innermost potential, but no less also from Christianity. Does the latter not overcome the otherness of the Jewish God through the principle of love, the reconciliation and unification of God and man, and the becoming man of God? As for the basic opposition between paganism and the Jewish break, it is definitely well-founded. Both paganism and Gnosticism, the reinscription of the Jewish Christian stance back into paganism, emphasize the inner journey of spiritual self-purification, the return to one's true inner self, the self's rediscovery, in clear contrast to the Jewish Christian notion of an external traumatic encounter. The divine call to the Jewish people, God's call to Abraham, inscrutable grace, all totally incompatible with our inherent qualities, even um, with our natural innate ethics. Kierkegaard was right here. It is uh, Socrates versus Christ, the inner journey of remembrance versus rebirth through the shock of the in external encounter. That is also the ultimate gap that forever separates Freud from Jung. While Freud's original insight concerns the traumatic external encounter with the thing that embodies Jewish science, Jung reinscribes the topic of the unconscious into the standard Gnostic problematic of the inner spiritual journey of self-discovery. All right, I'm going to stop there. Um, thanks for listening. Again, I'm probably going to record this over um, a couple videos because this one is getting pretty long. I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, I'm reading from um, The Monstrosity of Christ, Paradox or Dialectic. This is a chapter written by Zizek, um, and it is looking at um, the four words, the four problematic words, he was made man. Okay, hope you enjoyed that. Um, I will be picking back up at another time. Thanks so much.